Um, Anna's um, husband and I took a great bike ride all the way around uh, to um, some of the small villages, so it was wonderful. But again, it, it, very nice to um, see Jean in his home city. He's visited Cape Town twice and has been really instrumental in getting um, one of our sheep projects started in Cape Town. So um, he's operated on some sheep um, in Cape Town. And they're all still alive, so yeah, good. well done. <laughs> so so um, this, um, I'm going to be talking on the, on the mini slings. And um, I think it's, uh, they remain, um, a, a, this question is, is a very relevant one and we still um, are um, waiting for an answer. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the single incision slings haven't been spared all the drama of the um, traditional full length slings. And um, I know we're getting all quite tired of this whole d uh, debate and, and drama around the slings, but unfortunately they remain um, controversial as the other, um, you know, bigger slings. Um, they have been withdrawn in Australia as well, so just to tell you that, um, you know, they aren't, um, they've, they haven't been spared the controversy in Australia either, and yeah, you can actually see from the Therapeutics Good, Goods Agency in Australia where the Solix and the Altus um, were removed as well, which is, um, I found quite interesting. Um, on the other hand, the traditional slings um, are still looking very good actually, and the data is accruing very much in support of these devices. And um, yeah, this is the latest Cochrane review on both the transobturator and the, the retropubic sling. And um, yeah, you can see from their conclusions that um, we, we know that they are the most extensively researched surgical treatment for stress incontinence and they have a very good uh, safety profile. Um, and um, you know, they, we believe them to be highly effective and that is the conclusion from this uh, Cochrane Review. Um, and this is just one of the um, tables in that review where success rates um, are around 85% for both the transobturator and the retropubic. So we know that these are very effective devices. Um, so, and we're getting longer and longer term data for these specific devices. And so the question is, we've got a very good alternative to mini slings. Um, and now again, good long-term follow-up. Um, yeah, you can actually see um, after five years both the transobturator and the retropubic proving to be very effective. So the question is why would we want to embark on something different when we've got such an effective procedure? Um, the single incision slings became very uh, controversial um, with the TVT Secure and we um, in the Cochrane review that we did, um, the TVT Secure um, came out uh, very poor in terms of efficacy. I'll show you just some of the data. This was actually um, last reviewed in 2014, so we are currently working on the next review of this. But just to show you how much um, better the, um, the retropubic was, you can actually see that significantly better compared to the transobturator approach in this Cochrane review compared to um, there were basically three mini slings in this cohort. It was the, the mini arc, the adjust, and uh, the TVT secure. But about 20, about 80% of the uh, studies in this were TVT secure. So the TVT secure was one of the very first um, single incision slings that was invented. But you can actually see, even when it came to adverse events in the Scott review that we did, there was more mesh exposure with a relative risk of 3.75. Uh, there was more bladder and urethral erosion and there was more blood loss. So I think a lot of people got very jaded or very disappointed in the single incision slings with the um, bad outcomes of the TVT Secure, which was um, the, the first one. And I think it was this data from Promshaw Harb in Paris, which um, showed a um, 40% success rate for this, uh, this very first TVT uh, mini sling. And so I think it was following this that people really um, you know, became quite suspicious of them. Um, here's just one more um, case report where um, they showed a very um, big uh, hematoma um, in a patient who had a TVT secure. Um, and the theory was that you are coming a little bit closer to this corona mortis, which is uh, anastomosis between the obturator artery and the inferior epigastric artery. And, um, tending to more, be more likely to hit that 
compared to the outside in where you take a wider angle around the bone. So there were at least uh, three or four case reports of extensive hemorrhage following um, this and also following a mini arc. And so um, there have been now some publications which are using the TVT Secure as an example of um, the life cycle of a, um, of a bad product. And there you can actually see very promising reports, a lot of excitement. I remember about 10 years ago sitting in a meeting and hearing a really well-known and a very good urogynecologist um, talking about TVT Secure and telling us how wonderful it was. And here we are 10 years later um, hearing about the, the bad um, outcomes of, of that specific device. And so the big question is, um, are, was it a good evolution? Is this something that is still... Um, are these devices still an option for us? Um, and, and where are we with them? Um, I think the bottom line is that, and I don't need to tell you that the TVT retropubic and the transobturator approach um, still um, have their own complications. Um, we know that with a retropubic, you've got the risk of bladder injury. Yeah, you can see a trocar going into the bladder during the insertion. This is a spectacular complication of a retropubic TVT that was um, happened in my hospital um, where they didn't see that they'd uh, perforated the bladder during a, um, the retropubic placement. And three days later, they called me to say the patient was leaking urine from her um, uh, uh, pubic site. And when I went in um, to have a look, um, you know, it was, it was perforated into the bladder, so we removed that. But unfortunately, she was a very fat patient, and she proceeded to get necrotizing fasciitis. And yeah, you can actually see in this picture how we went in on a Saturday afternoon to debride the whole anterior abdominal wall down to the pubic bone. And that bottom left picture is um, about, I think it's about a month down the line where she was still had a huge gaping abdomen. So there are complications, and um, I don't want the lawyers in the UK to get hold of these pictures. I promise you I won't show you them. <laughs> um, and again, these are very uh, well-described complications. Here you can actually see on the left there's a patient who had another um, erosion into the bladder. The right picture, there was a stone that developed. So we know that there are significant complications from the retropubic device. This is a complication from a, a transobturator device that was done, again, in my hospital. And um, here you can actually see this patient presented a week later with pus coming out of the exit port um, on this transobturator approach. And um, we went in and took it out. And it came out very easily. It just slid out because there was pus uh, all around the um, insertion site. So this is a transobturator patient. Um, I've seen a few hematomas. I've got that picture on the left from one of, my, one of my friends in Holland. It wasn't my patient, but I certainly have seen a few retropubic hematomas. And uh, this I got out of a case report in the literature. So we know that there are significant complications from these um, small devices. I think one of the problems for me with the transobturator is this groin pain issue. And I think that has very much driven um, the negative sentiment around a lot of these slings. And depending on which... Um, you know, paper or study you read, it does, uh, it is quoted to be around 5%. Um, and as we know, that can be difficult to treat and it can be, um, you know, that can very much drive the litigation process. And I think this has been one of the problems that has driven the litigation issue in the UK. And we've been talking quite a lot the last day or two um, with some of my colleagues from the UK who are involved in the litigation and also in the removal of these devices. So I don't think we must underestimate this issue. When a patient does get pain from a transobturator approach, it can be a nightmare for both the patient and, and for you as a surgeon. Um, and just this is um, another interesting patient that, that I saw. Um, so this is a patient of mine. That's not on my screen yet either. Um, this is another patient of mine who presented with a huge golf ball sized stone on the, on the bladder um, from a, an eroded um, TVT. So it doesn't want to come back now on my screen. Oh, where's it gone? Okay. Good. So you can actually see this big stone there, um, and it meant that we had to go back, go in and actually cut the tape out of the bladder with this big stone with the urologist, and we had to do a marsh's flap, and it was, it was quite a complicated case. So, all right, so quo vadis, what do we actually do with these single incidents things? Do we throw them out completely? Are they still an option? Where do I fit? Where do they fit into my practice? This is a picture with the range of these 
uh, mini slings. Um, so for those of you who don't actually know what they are, they've all got a small piece of polypropylene, very almost exactly the same as the traditional tapes, but they all have a, um, some sort of anchor device that enables you to get them into the obturator fascia. They don't have a very high risk of bladder injury, although they have been described, and they also have a very low, low risk of groin pain. So that is what's driven the whole uh, process in terms of, of you know, still making these an option. Some of, them, some of them have been removed. That TVT Secure, the one on the top left, is the most notorious of all of them. Um, and I think we all believe that it didn't have a very good insertion um, sort of uh, mechanism. I never did any myself, um, but um, a lot of people in South Africa did do them. So that one, and then there was the, the mini arc, uh, which I know, um, which Anna Rosamilia and her team have um, in investigated quite extensively. Um, so that's got a nice, very good anchor, and I think it definitely uh, held him. But unfortunately, AMS removed it from the market for, for business reasons. Um, so the TVT Secure is also gone. Um, and then there was that Kermish is gone. Tissue fixation systems become quite controversial as well in, in Australia. So these are the ones that we have left. Um, at the just, I'm not sure, it's not available in South Africa, it's this one. But the most commonly performed ones in my, certainly in my area, are the Altus, the Solex, um, the Needless um, is also available. It's a Spanish product. I've done quite a few of those, and we were involved in the RCT on the Needless. And then the Ophir is um, also an Argentinian product, which is also still available. So why would you want to do a mini sling? So you can actually see, again, this is just a short video um, of, of what, how they actually, this is the Altus. Um, so the... Incision is made very. Is this video going to work? So the incision is made exa in exactly the same place as you do with the um, the bigger slings. Um, I do find that you have to make a much uh, a slightly bigger dissection on both sides when you do a single incision sling. Um, my other criticism of these devices is that the, they're a little bit more difficult to put in. You have to get the technique right. And I think there's a learning curve, so I think you definitely have to kind of get the knack of getting that um, anchor in. Uh, the transobturator and the retropubics, in my opinion, are a little bit more, um, it's more predictable, it's a little bit more standard to put in. So but there you can actually see the anchor and the altus. Um, and so this little knack of getting it in and teaching someone to get the hand movement right um, does take uh, a few cases. And I think it takes at least five cases before you are going to be able to do this uh, predictably and reliably. But there you can actually see, and this, I think this anchoring system is actually quite good on most of these modern ones that we use. Um, and um, again, um, I think it just is a little bit more fiddly. And I always say to people, make your incision a little bit bigger um, so you've got, little, you've got enough space to work when you put this um, device into the, um, you know, into that obturator fascia. Um, so get, get, get someone to train you if you are going to be doing some of these. Um, so with, in terms of the Altus, this one is registered in the, in the USA. This, is, um, this was their FDA registration trial, two-year follow-up, and 81% success rate. And so I'm just going to run through just some slides on data just to show you where we are with some of the studies. There is actually quite a lot of new data on these devices. Um, and um, I got this from... Um, the um, ICS meeting from last year. Uh, this is five-year data on the on the Altus, and there you can actually see it at 60 months, it's 89%. Unfortunately, in this poster, I couldn't see how many patients got to got to five years, but there it seems to be holding up quite nicely um, up to five years for the Altus. And I think it's going to be nice getting some longer-term data. Um, I know the Australian group is again, um, you know, going to give us some long-term data quite soon. So the Adjust, um, we kind of like this one because it's got that little anchoring system and it enables you to um, you know, adjust the tension somewhat. And there you can actually see quite a lot of studies and also a good few randomized trials um, on this specific device. And um, I'll, we'll look at some of the, um, you know, this, this in a little bit more detail, but um, yeah, again, you can see a uh, 12 month follow up with relatively good outcomes, uh, again, in the 80% in the 80 region, a little bit more. So this compares quite favorably to the, the, the standard slings that we see. 
Um, I think what comes out for me in a lot of the data on this is that in the first week, uh, there definitely is less pain, and that is, that is repeatedly shown in a lot of the trials. So th if the patient wants to have a lot less pain after one of these procedures, the mini slings have been shown to do that. And yeah, you can actually see one of, from the study um, up to about the first week, um, definitely significantly less pain. And again, shown um, in this um, study on the adjust, with uh, them also showing similar efficacy at one year. This was a meta-analysis, again on the adjust, and again, same patient reported cure rate, same objective cure, shorter operating time and less pain. And uh, so quite promising data, and this has, I think, kept the whole mini sling or single incision sling um, alive a as an option. Uh, this is, uh, just run through some of the other uh, products. This is the Ophira, which is, um, doesn't have any adjustability, and it basically just got this anchor that you stick into the obturator fascia. And again, data showing about 80, uh, around between 80 and 90% success rates. Um, Boston Scientific also has one. It's called the Solix. This is a very nice paper that hasn't been published yet, but it is a randomized trial and uh, with data up to three years as well, uh, comparing to the transobturated tape and um, no significant differences in outcomes and complication rates were also the same comparing the transobturator to the Solix, which is um, the Boston Scientific one, which has um, also just two anchors that you stick into the obturator fascia without any adjustability. So um, this um, review um, was published uh, early in this year by a Korean group. And um, I thought this was a very good idea, actually, because I think the TVTCQ really skewed our data. In our Cochrane review, it was quite hard to interpret because the TVTCQ was so bad that it skewed the data. So by removing the TVTCQ and looking at the other products that were available, um, I think it gave us a lot more of, of a better idea about how they look. And so just very quickly, um, again, um, taking all of these, and they, it was quite nice. They looked at the FIRA and the JUST. The JUST didn't appear too bad here. Um, a fear wasn't that good, but in, in looking at the total outcomes, uh, they were still definitely favoring the, 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 the longer slings or the traditional um, mid-urethral slings. Um, when you looked at it versus obturator, and then again compared it to the, to the, to the retropubic, um, it is approaching the line, but um, I think there's still um, a slight favor for the, the, single, the, the um, traditional slings versus the mini slings. And then obviously for the retropubic, I think this isn't surprising, it was definitely significantly better if you did a retropubic sling in this analysis. But again, as, as I've been saying, uh, pain up to one week. So this is, uh, this is day one and then going down to one week, you can actually see um, the single incision slings are better. So less pain, at the cost of um, maybe a, a little bit of a loss of inefficacy. So, I mean, I think you can really quote to your patients that you're gonna get about an 85% success rate, which is quite, um, quite good in my opinion, and almost comparable to uh, the traditional slings. We're getting a good number of randomized controlled trials, definitely better, uh, better uh, pain uh, control in the single incision slings. But um, I think, in terms of long-term data, we still don't know. Um, this is quite a nice um, paper from Norway where they took quite a large cohort of women looking at the TVT versus the transobturator approach. And the TVT retropubic still seems to be better than the transobturator. Um, we haven't got long-term data of the retropubic versus the, um, the TV, the, the mini slings. And I was talking to Anna yesterday, and they're actually now doing a trial on that. And so I'm very interested to, to hear some of that data. Um, and you're following yours up to five years. Yeah. So I think it's going to be very interesting to, to see what we get out of that. But this is the sort of stuff that is now starting to emerge and making us um, more likely to do a retropubic than a transobturator tape. And certainly my practice... A primary stress incontinence procedure, I'll, I'll always do a retropubic, simply because I think there is better efficacy. And I suspect we might see the same thing with the, um, with the mini slings. Um, 
This is just um, another randomized trial where you can actually see that there was more repeat surgery in the, in the mini sling. Um, and again, this is um, in special groups um, like patients with previous surgery. Uh, this is Paulo Palma from Argentina's group where they definitely had poorer outcomes in the patients who had a mini sling who had previous incontinence surgery. So uh, for me, in my practice, I definitely rather go for a retropubic sling if the patient had, 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 has had any other operation. Um, this is probably the most important question though. What, what do our patients really want? Um, and what do, what do women really want? It's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, but I did find this paper by um, Jan Paul Rufus um, in Amsterdam, where they are starting to look at um, you know, what, what patients really want and patients' choice. And this was a very nice study where they basically used graphs and, and special um, sort of visual analog scales with patients, comparing efficacy to, to other um, adverse events. And here you can actually see that they will trade 4% less efficacy for two days less pain um, and 7% lower efficacy for, for, for two, two weeks less pain. And so this is where you can actually start to see, and I've certainly had patients asking me for, to do a mini sling. I had a gynecologist um, from another hospital phone me and said, you will come on Friday morning to my hospital and do an altus on me, and so-and-so will assist you, and you don't need to examine me, just arrive there and do the sling on me, please. Because I don't want another sling, I want to have less pain. And luckily she did very well. So this is patient driven, um, and I certainly think it's something that we should possibly be offering our patients. So are these little guys really uh, ready for the big time? Um, there are issues with the learning curve. I don't think you can convert almost seamlessly. I, you know, with, even with the different devices, if you move from an Altus to a Solix, I think there is a learning curve. I think you do need to be taught properly how to do these things. I think the anchoring and the, I mean, the, the actual adjustment is also important. Um, you can make them too loose, I think, as well. That's maybe why they sometimes fail. Um, they aren't all exactly the same. The anchors are a little bit different. Um, the long-term data is still lacking. Um, I also think that in this um, era, era where there's so much drama around slings, to be doing something that is slightly less um, supported by data might also be a little bit of a problem. And we don't have a lot of data comparing it to the retropubic TVT, but I'm glad to, to see that the um, Anna's group is doing that. I still do use a lot of mini slings, um, and um, I use it in the scenario where we've got um, patients having a prolapse operation and either occult or also com or confirmed stress incontinence. So I like to actually add them to a prolapse operation. I think it's a less invasive um, option and so this is where I do it, and um, this is just um, a group who actually looked specifically at the use of an altus during robotic sacral copepexy, and they found that um, it certainly worked and the complications were, were much lower. So I don't use them pr primarily um, as my main stress incontinence procedure, but I basically use them mainly for um, when I do it as a, as a concurrent type procedure. So that's really um, all I've got to say about mini slings. Um, are we going to have questions now? We're going to move on. Okay.